Hi, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. We are live on Instagram. Hi, everyone. I'm Christine Barry. Welcome to Barry Campbell Gallery. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We are recording this, so this will also be on YouTube, the Barry Campbell YouTube page later. Um, and just a wonderful Thursday night here in Chelsea in New York. Um, we are so excited about this exhibition, West Coast Women of Abstract Expressionism. As many of you know, Martha Campbell and I have really had a specialty with women from the 1950s. It's really a focus in an area that we love to research and study. And many years ago, when the Denver Art Museum had their exhibition, Women of Abstract Expressionism, in about 2016, um, we saw in that show a lot of artists that we did not know. And some of them were artists from the East Coast, but some of these artists were from the West Coast, a lot of the artists we didn't know. And that sort of planted a little seed with us, and this is how it happens often when we're curating shows, is what is it that interests us and what do we want to learn? And so this is how this started, and about a year ago we said, we wanna do this show of West Coast women, and we know many of them, Jada Feo, Joe Brown, Bernice Bing, but there are many names in this gallery that you may have never heard of, and these artists were known in their day. They were working, acting, artists, professionals, professors. Francis is gonna tell us more about that. And so from this, we met Francis Lazar, and we were so honored to work with Francis. She wrote the essay for our catalog, which is up front, and you're welcome to have a copy of on your way out. And so she had the job of trying to explain to those of us here on the East Coast um, who are these artists on the West Coast and explain a little bit more and talk about the parallels and how it was different on um, the West Coast. So let me read a little bit about Francis here. Francis is an art historian and curator whose research focuses on histories of abstract painting in the 19th through 21st centuries. At the University of Southern California, she is completing a dissertation on queer and fem feminist sociability in and around the New York School of Painters titled Intimate Abstraction. Grants from the Terra Foundation for American Art and the New York Public Library have generously supported this project. She has held curatorial positions at the Menil Collection in Houston, the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, and the Norton Simon Museum. She has taught post-war art history at USC, Southern California Institute of Architecture, and Art Center College of Design. And we're so pleased to have you here, Frances. She's gonna take us around the three different galleries and then we'll open it up to questions at the end. So thank you so much. I really resonate with this kind of story that Christine is telling about being a post-war specialist. I specialize in the history of abstract painting in the 20th century, really, and having the exciting opportunity to work on the paintings of some of these incredible women who have made, you know, really important contributions to American modernist painting, but a lot of the names were really unfamiliar to me. And so I thought, how is it that, you know, if I'm not aware of these women, then many people are going to not have a lot of context for who some of these incredible um, and exciting women painters are. So I was really excited to have the opportunity to do this. And I feel like, you know, it really relates to this kind of correction or movement that's happening in the field right now, whereby, you know, the history of abstract expressionism is so tied to this trope of the kind of solitary studio bound painter. And even as we sort of recognize that as a trope, we, you know, it's really hard to break down. And so really important uh, scholars and women curators such as Joan Martyr, Susan Landauer have made really important contributions. And I think that this dual kind of insertion of the West Coast artists really works sort of in tandem with these dual disciplinary corrections. And so I think it was my interest in this overlap of sort of um, being sidelined geographically and also on the basis of gender and what implications that had for these women artists. And I think that, 
you know, there was pleasure and pain in that, but a lot of these women really um, kind of found a place where they could, there goes the air, um, where they could really, you know, engage deeply with each other's work, engage, engage deeply with the local art world that they were creating in a way that was very particular to the San Francisco Bay. So in order to kind of, before we walk around and um, get into some of this um, amazing, these amazing paintings, I'm gonna give us a little bit of background, sort of transport us um, into the San Francisco Bay Area of the 1940s and 1950s. And the reason that I do this is because some of this institutional history wasn't even that familiar to me as a post-war art historian, as I said. And I think it's really important because San Francisco has a trajectory in terms of its art world and its style of painting that in some ways parallels New York's um, very much, but also there's a lot of kind of particularities to the institutional setting there. And one of those particularities I found through engaging with the research for this project really was that from the very beginning, um, women curators, scholars, and artists had an extremely foundational role in the formation of this art world and its kind of institutional uh, geography. And so this is somebody who, I'm gonna introduce us to the curator Grace McCann Morley and get into a little bit of the formation of the art world um, and how abstract expressionism and abstract painting sort of burst onto the scene in San Francisco, in some ways a little bit before even in New York, um, and then go and look at some particular works. But I think in order to do that, we have to really talk about this really important and exciting curator, Grace McCann Morley, who was the first director of the, what is now the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. And I bring her up just to say that, you know, when in 1934 she was appointed as director, this was, you know, this was still, this was totally groundbreaking to have this woman um, as the director. And we have these analogs in the New York situation. We have Dorothy Miller, for instance, um, curator at MoMA, who's very important, but I think just her role as the director of SF MoMA, and she had studied um, at Harvard and at the Sorbonne, and she brought a lot of French, German, um, European modernists to San Francisco. And because of her curatorial interventions at this fledgling museum, um, interest in abstraction, interest in expressionist painting, loose gestural paint handling, things like that that we really associate with mid-century painting really started to burst onto the scene um, even from the 1930s and 1940s. Um, and so one of Morley's sort of the things that she, you know, kind of had this really fortuitous um, act was to bring Douglas McKaigie, who is a curator and a scholar, and his wife, Jermaine McKaigie, to San Francisco. And um, these two, this kind of power art couple was really, they're kind of overlooked still. These are even, you know, outside the bounds of this show in terms of their names, but I wanted to bring them up, especially Jermaine McKaigie, because she was so important in kind of setting you know, the institutional groundwork, creating this fertile intellectual situation out of which West Coast abstraction could arise. Um, and so these two come from Cleveland. Jermaine McKaigie is one of the first women, um, maybe the first, I think, to receive her PhD in art history. And she is the curator at the um, San Francisco Fine Art Museums. And Douglas McKaigie is appointed by McCann Morley as the head of the San Francisco Art Institute, which is where our characters here really come into play is vis-a-vis -vis the San Francisco Art Institute. And so this is 1945, Morley brings this incredible power couple in and you know, there's a quote like, after that, abstract expressionism sort of ripped through the Bay Area in this near instantaneous fashion. It was just really like, you know, flame um, going up. And in large part because of these three figures, two of which are these really important women. And so um, 
McKay, uh, Jermaine McKeggie is over curating exhibitions at, um, at the San Francisco Fine Arts Museum. She brings Jackson Pollock in in 43. This is when he's still uh, working with Peggy Guggenheim. So she's really this kind of forebearer. And then Douglas McKeggie, for his part, comes in and kind of scraps SFAI. He decides to kind of go ground up with um, the institutional situation there. And so um, he is very lucky because in 1945, as we know, the Second World War is ending. And he has the great fortune to be in the position of um, being at SFAI, at the Art Institute, um, just at the moment that the GI Bill is passed, which um, gives money to veterans to um, get education for free on war bonds. And they a lot of um, GIs go to art schools. And that is true. That is very much the case in New York, too. And I think, you know, to just draw our attention to those parallels, that's very much the case in terms of uh, GIs pouring into art schools in New York. And so you really have that at SFAI. And he's very lucky because he has this, he's in this kind of really fertile situation and there's this influx of cash. And so he's able to kind of, you know, make what was a kind of previously sleepy school by some accounts really into this hotbed of abstract expressionism. Um, and when we think of this kind of post-war moment, I think that the standard narrative for those of us who are kind of in on post-war art history is really that the art world catapults from Paris to New York, but before even you know this sort of institutional recognition of ABEX, here in New York you have SFAI playing this really key role, and um, and that's really largely due to these kind of institutional interrelations that I've just sketched. And so I'm going to bring us into the other room and look at a painting by a faculty member at SFAI and kind of think through some of these paintings. Um, with more particularity. We're gonna be looking at this painting by Ruth Armour. Um, so, which I think is really one of the gems of this show and this room is really chocked full of gems. So it's really exciting. It's just really exciting to be here with these works and get to spend time with them. So um, when, Douglas McKeggie came in and sort of like scrapped SFAI and decided to sort of, you know, redo the school curricula. Um, he did keep on several key faculty members and Ruth Armour was one of them. So I just want to highlight these continuities as well as the breaks and to say that Armour really was a native San Franciscan. She did leave um, San Francisco. She came here to New York. Um, she studied with Robert Henri here and George Bellows, um, but then she returned um, to San Francisco. So I think that a lot of this, what this show kind of illuminates is the ways that Bay Area artists were really deeply engaged with the history of the Bay Area, history of painting in the Bay Area, um, and had a real commitment um, to the Bay Area as a site of making. And Armour really does exemplify that in a lot of ways. So um, Armour, I really love this work because She's somebody who, in the kind of previous or early stages of her career, really was engaging in surrealist, abstract surrealism, the kind of spattery, free-flowing application of paint that we often associate with abstract expressionism, that for, with Pollock, for instance. Um, and she had been engaged with expressionism and abstract surrealism earlier in her career. But this work um, from 1950 shows her really moving in a different direction. And it shows her um, really engaging with depth and space and using paint as this kind of, and color as these building blocks to carve out the canvas um, almost sculpturally. And I think that it's, it's a really compelling work for that reason. And there's a great quote, um, by a faculty member at SFAI that said a lot of the uh, faculty members um, went for toughness 
above taste. And I think that there is a toughness to this work um, uh, and the kind of um, the ways she's engaging geometric abstraction, but there's still this um, really exciting vibrancy to it. And so Armour was one of these women who, despite the kind of lore around Douglas McKaigie as kind of redoing the whole show, she was there, she taught many women artists, she was an institution in and of herself. And so I love that idea of the toughness versus over taste. And so that I think really stands out as, you know, one of the tendencies associated with Bay Area abstraction and abstract expressionism. And another one I think is real interest in interdisciplinarity. And that was certainly the case in New York as well. Um, there were many collaborations between painters and poets. Um, but I think that this is even just amped up um, at SFAI and in the Bay Area more generally. And it's something that when that kind of stronghold breaks up in the 1950s around that school, sort of spills out into the neighborhoods below. So SFAI is on um, in the Russian Hill neighborhood. It's up on this hill. It really is this kind of ivory tower-esque institution. And so a lot of the ideas and themes that are cultivated there after um, McKaigie leaves in 1950 start to spill down um, into the city, into North Beach, into Haight-Ashbury, into the Fillmore. Um, and we'll look at the kind of residues of that um, in some later work. But so I wanted to just really stress interdisciplinarity and the ways that there was just this kind of freewheeling and dealing aspect of that school. And it's it's important to think about, especially because SFAI recently closed. And so that was 150 years of history. Um, so I think it's just, and it bespeaks the importance of this show in really preserving um, West Coast OPEX because its institutions um, are, you know, are, are not as live. Um, so, so yeah, so McKaigie started a, a jazz band with faculty members. Um, and so there was this real interest in the commingling between jazz and poetry and music and open studios and you know this kind of big jam sesh that really carries over. And so next we're gonna look at this painting right over here by the painter Zoe Longfield as a kind of continuation of that ethos that's established uh, you know, within SFAI. Can you see it okay? Okay, so um, this painting by Longfield um, was first shown at a gallery cooperative um, called Met Art Gallery. So I wanna kind of think about the ways that this kind of like freewheeling and dealing, interdisciplinarity that's being cultivated, but very much in this kind of ivory tower setting again, just bursts um, into the city below. And so Zoe Longfield studied with Clifford Still. Um, McKaigie was also really instrumental in bringing um, New York painters, which really bespeaks the kind of porousness of these coasts, this narrative that the coasts are very much cordoned off from one another, I think doesn't necessarily hold true. You have artists like Armour going to New York and coming back and you had New York artists uh, very much coming and spending time in San Francisco. And famously, one of those artists is Clifford Still who kind of withdrew in a lot of ways from the New York art world. Um, he had this kind of really insistent view that he wanted to have curatorial control over the reception of his work. And in fact, one of the only curators he really trusted was Jermaine McKaigie, Douglas McKaigie's wife. So he, that and that impetus, the this, this sense that artists should be the one hanging their own work, uh, you know, presenting it, uh, lighting it, really let, is this sort of, that desire led him to found Met Art Gallery, which was a gallery cooperative um, in the northern end of San Francisco. Um, and his inner circle from SFAI, he brought them with him um, to Met Art Gallery. And Zoe Longfield was one of these painters that was in his inner circle. And it's, it was really, um, difficult, still was very discerning um, to be invited into the fold and to be invited into this senior seminar that he um, held. And so 
for her. She was one of the only artists of either sex, really, to be invited into that. And then she was invited to be a part of Met Art Gallery. Um, and if you go to the first gallery on the right, entering the show, Fran Spencer was also a part of, of Met Art. So, there's a lot of parallels in some ways with the 10th Street cooperatives um, coming out of Hans Hoffman's school. So here you have the pedagogue, uh, Clifford Still, and his students kind of continuing his legacy through Met Art. And so I love this painting by Zoe Longfield. I think it's, you know, it's really interesting color choice, the biomorphic abstraction. I think you can really see um, in some ways Still's influence um, in the ways that you have these interlocking kind of forms that are very much on the surface. The background color, I think, is kind of reminiscent. But in other ways, it's very much her own. And Longfield was known among her peers as really being somebody who apparently just had blinders on. She was able to you know, not suffer from anxiety of influence in the way that we often think about, uh, especially in New York. Um, you know, there's this sense um, in the 50s that, you know, everybody's gone the de Kooning route and, you know, these figures are really looming large. And um, I think one of the things that's exciting about a lot of this work is that there, you know, these women painters bear traces of their influences without really you know, necessarily needing to emulate them. And I think that she's a really exciting and interesting example of that. So this being you know, on view at Met Art Gallery and, this, and that being one of um, the city's first gallery cooperatives. And I'm gonna bring us over um, to the right to talk about another gallery cooperative um, and the role of this painter, Deborah Remington, um, in the foundation of that cooperative. So again, it's, I just think it's a really interesting parallel in some ways, the, the cooperatives in New York, um, Hansa Gallery, um, even Jane Street Gallery, which is founded um, over in the East Village in the early 40s. But um, the San Francisco um, cooperatives are even kind of more militant in some ways about the rejection of commerce and the rejection of these kind of uh, hardened art world systems. And so that's really what leads to the founding of the Sixth Gallery, which is the gallery cooperative where um, Remington was a founding member and she was the only female founding member. And so you have, in 1950, Douglas McKaigie departing SFAI, and this is that moment when in some ways, the 1945 to the early 50s is thought of as the kind of golden age of Abex. But you'll notice that in this show, a lot of the paintings are after that date. And that's because this kind of second wave where a lot of those impulses that were fomenting at SFAI spilled into the city, um, that's where a lot of the women really were leading the charge. And that's very much the case here with Remington as one of the founding members of the Sixth Gallery, along with Wally Hedrick, who was married to Jay DeFeo, um, Jack Spicer. And so there's a lot of lore surrounding the Sixth Gallery that even I didn't know until I dug into this. So I think it's really fun to just have in our mind. So this, Christine and I were talking about this, this may or may not have been hanging when um, Allen Ginsberg read Howell for the first time, but the Sixth Gallery really was this garage-like space in the Fillmore neighborhood um, that's a little bit to the west of Russian Hill where SFAI is and a lot of the artists start migrating there for cheap rents, uh, cheap exhibition spaces like the Sixth Gallery, which according to some uh, period accounts really was just a garage and that was really just they had they had great parties like when um, Ginsburg read Howell and the openings were really the main event and the artist never really sold work um, at least according to period sources I don't know for sure but really this kind of sense of that conviviality that was emergent with McKaigie's SFAI really taking it on a new life. And this is the moment where the beat generation starts to take form. And a lot of these women are adjacent to that. They're adjacent to a lot of really exciting 
um, art historical and literary movements. And so the idea that this painting was potentially there when Ellen Ginsberg first read Howell is hysterical and amazing. And um, that was apparently an event that was you know, shocking to many and was later um, fictionalized by Jack Kerouac. But Remington's work, you know, I think it's related to a lot of the kind of beat movement um, and other artists associated with the six, but it's also really singular in a lot of ways. I think you can see a Bay Area look. Um, when I look at this painting, I see um, some resonances of Richard Diebenkorn, for instance, in this sort of planar view, the aerial view of um, the Bay Area and its unique topographies, but it's also really kind of uniquely her own. And her colors, for instance, are so unique, so sensuous, um, and really distinct. I, I don't often see this kind of greeny, um, yellow, um, and so it in some ways looks like fields from above, but also their bodily reference, and it's really, um, really wonderful painting. And we're actually really lucky because these early works by Remington, this from 1953 are hard to come by. Her later work was very distinct from these early paintings. So to see one of these on view, to have that, maybe this was there during that kind of legendary moment, it's really exciting. And if you turn around, you can see that there's another one of her paintings on the back wall or on the other side wall um, as well. So this is really, personally, I just got to see the show for the first time, and this is such a standout piece, and I, I have absolutely loved, yeah, I have loved um, Bing's work for a long time, and so I'm so excited to be here with one of these. Um, Stanford University just acquired her papers, so hopefully someone will write an amazing book about her soon. But the segue here really being that Bernie Bing, like Deborah Remington, like many of the painters in this show, including Nell Stinton, Irene Pattinson, was really engaging with the unique topography of the San Francisco Bay Area. And um, Joan Brown, the painter, actually said, there's this kind of psychic energy that emerges from being near the mountains, being near the water. And so um, Bing is somebody whose work very much epitomizes that vis-a-vis -vis her kind of earthen palettes. Um, this work is, um, she here references Velazquez. She's also very interested in the history of art. So Bing is a really um, fascinating character who also epitomizes the ways that women in this second wave of SF Abex were had their hands in a, in a lot of things. They were um, they were gallerists. They were curating shows. They were um, doing a lot of things. And she was very much both an artist and an activist. Um, she started a a not-for-profit for that was aimed at, you know, cutting waste in the Bay Area. But all of this is to say that she's a very dynamic figure, and she's also very shaped by the unique particularities of the Bay Area, its social realities, its institutional realities. Um, Bing was born in San Francisco. She is a Chinese-American um, painter, and she was born at a moment when a lot of prejudiced um, there was a hangover of prejudice against um, Chinese Americans in the Bay Area. Um, and so she, her experience in the Bay really was shaped by this. Um, she was raised in various foster homes um, and by um, parents who were white. So this kind of sense in her own words that there was a gulf between herself and her own cultural heritage. And that was a gulf that she really attempted to bridge in paint. And so she has this really unique background. She studied at Berkeley, also at SFAI, um, but she also was interested in traditional Chinese calligraphy and married her interest in art history in calligraphy and in this engagement with the particularities of uh, the mountains and 
the colors of the SF Bay that we just kind of witnessed in uh, the Remington as well, that kind of sensuous earthen palette that is very present in a lot of Bing's works. This is a, a much brighter piece um, in some ways, but you still see these kind of moments of these kind of earthen colors bursting through and the ways that she's handling paint um, are so exciting and vibrant um, and, and really wonderful. And so she is one of these women who I think is starting to gain a little bit more um, traction in histories of um, ABEX and, and really kind of this scene maker and shaper and activist and artist in the Bay Area. Um, so I think that we can kind of end by moving into uh, this final gallery. I don't know if we'll all fit, but um, so it's really apt that these two women are hanging next to each other. This is a painting by um, John Brown and a drawing, a work on paper, uh, rather by Jade Feo. And this pairing is sort of perfect. So. Um, I was talking a little bit earlier about the cooperative galleries that are forming in San Francisco, Met Art, The Six. Um, so that very much is one aspect of the Fillmore, um, these kind of you know, garage band galleries. But there is also a kind of domestic equivalent to that that's happening at a building on 2322 Fillmore Street that gets nicknamed, I believe by Bruce Connor, Painterland. Um, and both Joan Brown and Jay DeFeo live there at various um, moments and then they are there at the same time. And so they really shared domestic space with one another, making this a really amazing and perfect pairing. And so this was, you know, a space that was home, but also where the studios of these artists were, uh, where dinner parties were held, where impromptu exhibitions were held, taking those, you know, that kind of jam band uh, mentality and taking it even further into the domestic confines of life. And so this painting by John Brown in some ways kind of exemplifies the, the way that life at Painterland would have very much seeped into art making and that kind of contributed to this idea of the art of a first name. Um, so this is called Reaching for Chicken at Jack's. And so I don't have exact confirmation. I was thinking it's a Jack Kerouac, but I think maybe this might be Jack Spicer, who I just mentioned as one of the founders of the Sixth Gallery. Um, so, you know, She's very much naming the people that she's in dialogue with, that she's in community with, in the titles of her work. And so even though you have this abstract painting, um, it is this sort of uh, bringing in of reference to everyday life, to the particularities of a scene into her painting practice. And Brown was kind of known for saying, for me, it's San Francisco or nowhere. Um, she was really wedded to the scene there. And, Joan Brown is having this moment, uh, very thankfully, where she's sort of getting a renewed amount of attention and people are really rightly engaging with her practice. And when I think of Joan Brown or what I've often seen of Joan Brown is very figural work, very bright work. And um, that is an enormous part of her practice. She metabolized, um, Bay Area figuration after um, Douglas McKaigie leaves SFAI um, and that kind of his hold there breaks up. You have um, Elmer Bischoff and David Park pioneering um, Bay Area figuration and Brown very much metabolizes a lot of those influences. But before that figural work for which she's most known, she's very much engaged with abstraction and really with material experiment. Um, she takes the kind of attitude and atmosphere of experimentation that's um, forming in the film more. Um, and she, she really channels that into painting via the kind of um, accretions of wet over wet paint. You see that if you have the chance um, after I'm done here to come and look at this work, 
the surface is extremely worked. There's a lot of um, movements of paint. You have these moments where there's this incredible impasto and buildup. Um, and so this really was, in some ways, a document of experimentation. Um, and it, it really bespoke the kind of um, atmosphere of play and fun, um, which she was engaged um, at Painterland. And so hang hanging next to um, Brown's work is this, very appropriately, is this work by Jay DeFeo. Um, and there's this potentially kind of mythic tale. Not, it's not verified, but the artist Bruce Connor remembers um, that these two women were very close friends. They both lived in 23, 22 Fillmore, and potentially at one point, they were tired of having to go out of their apartment and down and around to get into each other's homes and knock down the walls um, so that they could share a studio with one another. And so these are women whose practices very much um, really develop in concert, in tandem with one another, and they might look very distinct, but I think there's also a lot of resonances. And Jada Feo is most known for similar kinds of material experimentation as Joan Brown, that sort of impasto that I just spoke about, this building up of the surface through um, layers and layers and layers of paint is what DeFeo is kind of most known for. Uh, her painting, The Rose, um, was painted in Painterland um, at 2322 Fillmore and apparently had to be lifted out because it was created uh, very much to the specificities of her studio there. And so this interest in material experiment that kind of metabolizes that environment of experimentation um, is very much shared. And here you have a little bit of a later work, but it also shows the kind of um, her interest in gestural abstraction, but also I think a kind of um, interest in forms that are joining one another. And this is something that I really thought about while I was engaging with a lot of this work is there's so many distinct kind of tendencies that these painters are kind of enlivening, one being uh, the environment, the landscape of San Francisco, but another tendency that I really started to notice was this interest in joining many different factors, many, many different elements. Um, and I think that there is a really kind of poetic, a uh, way that that speaks to the many different bodies and people that are commingling in Painterland. The Fillmore itself is going through this enormous transformation. It has a very active black middle class. There's also um, the Japanese Americans who were interned. They start to return to their neighborhood um, in the 1940s. And so you have the commingling of many different people, many different ideas, and that's what gives the Fillmore this um, really vibrant kind of environment. Um, and these artists very much are interested in preserving this as a kind of site for um, many people. And so I think that you can see here the ways that there are interlocking forms. And I think it can bring our attention uh, to this work by Claire Falkenstein, um, which in some ways is a kind of bridge between uh, this DeFeo and this Joan Brown piece. You have, again, this interest in material experiment, um, in welding. Um, she's known for these kind of assemblage forms. Um, but again, this really interesting interlocking, interlacing of distinct elements um, in a way that I think really uh, beautifully encapsulates what the environment of San Francisco was. And if you walk around the show, I think you'll see some resonances of that formal tendency in a lot of the artist's work, including Lily Feinickel, um and other artists. So it's a really exciting show, and I'm super grateful to have gotten the chance to dig into so many of these women's practices. And yeah, thank you. Thank you.